I was here during the summer uh, working with the uh, Central Archives on uh, the uh, <coughs> farm labor program, and I have a, a small section of the presentation that's going to also focus on, on that topic. Let me first, first explain the subtitle. It's kind of strange for me and perhaps for many of you to call or even question whether Puerto Rico is a colonial or a post-colonial uh, state or, or, or situation. What happens is that uh, last semester I was invited to present uh, this paper, uh, which, which is circulating uh, around in, the, in a uh, more extended form, and within the context of post-colonial migration as it was called to Europe, and particularly to the Netherlands. And the Dutch are very uh, straightforward in that regard. They say that they have two types of migration, one of which, which is post-colonial, meaning from their old colonies in the East Indies in Indonesia, and then uh, the uh, still remaining uh, possessions in the Caribbean, the, ne the Netherlands, the Antilles. So they wanted to compare whether that kind of uh, rupture also existed in other countries like the United States and um, other places in Europe. In this case, I think, uh, and, and I guess that's going to be my main argument, I think the post-colonial label doesn't really apply to Puerto Rico, but it's kind of uh, still challenging to, to go through some of the uh, ways in which the Puerto Rican situation doesn't quite fit that post-colonial situation uh, in the Netherlands and other countries. So that's, that's why the title, and in the end, I guess, uh, the presentation will try to answer the question whether it is or not uh, post-colonial. I won't go through all the details. The paper is available. It's very long. It's kind of panoramic. It has all kinds of data. But I do want to emphasize five main points. First of all, let me uh, briefly review the issues about whether Puerto Rico can be described as colonial or post-colonial, what's involved in that, and more importantly, uh, for my purposes, does it have, uh, uh, does it make any difference in terms of explaining migration processes uh, from Puerto Rico since about World War II, although I'll give you some historical background again uh, as well. So every time I, I mention the word post-colonial, I'll put it in, in quotes because it doesn't really apply as I said before and I hope uh, most of you will agree with me. Then I want to go into uh, some detail as to the, the significance of the farm workers program, which as I mentioned before is part of the research that I did here at the center in the summer. And for me, it was eye-opening because it is an example of the ways in which the Puerto Rican government after 1952 tried to be to behave uh, as if it were uh, a nation state and yet did it within the confines of the federal government. So it's very contradictory and very ambiguous. And that's what I want to emphasize, the ambiguities and the contradictions of the colonial, post-colonial society. And then, uh, more specifically, I want to talk a little bit about uh, changing patterns of Puerto Rican settlement in the United States in the past uh, 20 years or so. Uh, I won't go into details about the new migration to uh, Florida, which is also a topic of my talk. I will mention some of the ways in which Puerto Ricans are coming to the United States and are now going to the new Mecca, and so the new Mecca now seems to be the state world. And then finally, the last part of the presentation, we're focus on a selected number of transnational cultural practices, and I use the word transnational also in a broad sense, and it, it, when, when, I, when discussing the Puerto Rican case, it also becomes uh, an object of debate. Just before I came here, uh, actually, Edwin Melendez and Dolores Gardo was working on similar topics uh, uh, regarding political science, uh, and I were talking um, in the hallway, and uh, we both agreed that in general, the transnational migration literature ignores altogether the Puerto Rican case simply because it's not a, a nation state, it's not a sovereign uh, republic. And yet, I think in many ways, Puerto Ricans do not differ significantly from other transnational migrants like Mexicans, Dominicans, and so forth, except that, of course, they do have uh, U.S. citizenship and they can move back and forth more freely than other people. That's sort of the, the sketch of it, and I see if I can do this more just quickly to, to have discussions with you. So what's the case for post-colonialism? Uh, first of all, according to uh, proponents of the Estado de Social, the Commonwealth government, which was established in 1952, uh, according to them, uh, the Puerto Rican uh, uh, voters exercised their right to self-determination when they chose the Estado de Social uh, of that year. More than 82% of all Puerto Rican voters uh, voted for the Commonwealth Constitution, and therefore, according to this theory, uh, uh, which is, of course, associated with, with the Popular Democratic Party, that promotes uh, this, this uh, status uh, option. There was an agreement, a compact, is, is a term, the legal term, that they emphasized between the Puerto Rican people and the United States, that it's a free compact and it can be entered and uh, it can resolve uh, bilaterally. Uh, to the extent that the Puerto Rican government has uh, attained a number uh, of, of um, 
has, has control over a number of issues like education, health, cultural, language, mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, the the post-colonial situation of, of Puerto Rico would refer to this fact that Puerto Rico has attained a substantial but not uh, complete form of self-government. On the other hand, regardless of the actual political status, cultural nationalism in Puerto Rico is extremely strong and growing and growing over the last uh, five decades or so. And, and also what's interesting uh, to talk about uh, a little later is that it, it spills over to the diaspora and also here in the United States you find very strong assertions of Puerto Rican cultural identity. And finally, um, except for sovereignty, which of course is the most important uh, attribute of, of statehood, the Puerto Rican government has also developed all kinds of symbolic uh, expressions of nationhood, beginning with the flag, uh, the anthem, um, the icon of the Puerto Rican, the Puerto Rican culture, Olympic representation in sports, uh, this universe, those kinds of things, which may sound trivial to many people who don't think of, of nations uh, in those terms. Uh, some critics have pointed out that Puerto Ricans experience a light form of nationalism uh, that does not translate itself into support for independence. But in any case, those are, as I see it, sort of the, the main uh, reasons why some people might want to call Puerto Rican Puerto Rico post-colonial. Now, the case for colonialism begins with the legal definition of Puerto Rico as an unincorporated territory. Uh, many people don't really know what that actually means. It means that we're not a state, we're not uh, independent, uh, and according to the uh, Supreme Court of the United States, we belong to but are not part of the United States. And that phrase, too, uh, the, the idea that Puerto Rico is somehow foreign in a domestic sense of the United States, uh, which doesn't seem to make any sense in terms of uh, you know, everyday logic, according to the legal doctrine that developed um, since the beginning of the 20th century, that's what uh, Puerto Rico is all about. On the other hand, uh, it's a colonial situation because not all the rights and privileges of U.S. citizenship apply to Puerto Rico, including, of course, voting for the President of the, uh, the United States or the Vice President. Uh, Congress still retains uh, plenary power, which means ultimate authority over uh, Puerto Rico. <coughs> There's no congressional representation from the island. There is no vote for the president or the vice president, and of course there's no representation in international uh, um, spaces where other nation states might be represented. So uh, then uh, uh, a third option may be, which, which some uh, scholars have used, including Juan Flores, to call in, in very contradictory term Puerto Rico post-colonial colony. And let, let me see if I can uh, sort of tease out for you what that would imply. First of all, I think most everyone in Puerto Rico uh, uh, agrees that there's a need for re reform. Even the pro Commonwealth Party is proposing some sort of enhanced form of Commonwealth. Nobody really wants to have or whatever we have right now. So there's a consensus about the need for change. On the other hand, there's also a consensus that Puerto Rico cannot really survive economically uh, at this point without having all kinds of uh, economic benefits from the United States, and therefore the support for what's called the Puerto Rico Permanent Association is very strong. Whether that would mean, again, some sort of enhanced commonwealth or full statehood, uh, that's, of course, where we have a very strong disagreement. But I think, by and large, most Puerto Rican voters uh, think of, of, of the future in terms of some very strong connection with the U.S. government. The fact that Puerto Ricans have been able to move back and forth between Puerto Rico and the United States because they were citizens in 1917, and I'll go back to that issue before, also has become something of a right and something that uh, is very difficult to, to imagine what Puerto Rico would look like if Puerto Ricans were not able to come to the United States as they have for the past uh, 100 years. And also something that I have uh, been writing about is the issue of uh, what U.S. citizenship actually means for national identity in most cases, they're the same thing. So for example, if you go to France and you ask a French person what that, their citizenship, what their nationality is, it's French. But in the Puerto Rican case, of course, mo all Puerto Ricans have a US passport, and yet when uh, they're polled, they say their nationality is, is Puerto Rican. So that's a, a very uh, interesting divorce between those two concepts that normally go together. Uh, and finally, uh, again, uh, over the last uh, 50 years or so, the pro-independence movement has really lost uh, significant support in Puerto Rico, and most Puerto Ricans today seem to imagine their nation as, again, somehow connected or dependent on the United States. So uh, then let me uh, uh, sort of go back a little bit in terms of some of the colonial aspects of the relationship between Puerto Rico and the United States and how that plays out today in the, uh, in the, in the case of the diaspora. This is a, a quite uh, remarkable uh, cartoon, I don't know if you can see it well, those babies on the right, 
have uh, have been labeled Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and the Hawaii. And, and, and Hawaii. The two light-skinned ones are Puerto Rico and and, uh, and Cuba. The other ones are the Philippines and uh, and Hawaii. And it's Uncle Uncle Sam. And also on the back, you see uh, uh, white uh, children dancing. And uh, I can't really tell, but they're the names of uh, former territories that became state and seem to be inside the union. So this is sort of the, the you know the beginnings of, of the images and the discourses. Uh, clearly with a colonial and racialized uh, intention that circulated in, in the United States uh, since uh, uh, at least uh, the Spanish Cuban American War. Uh, another well-known image, uh, Uncle Sam's Burden from 1899, has those three babies uh, labeled Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines, and then uh, the title Uncle, Sa Uncle Sam's Burden. Uh, this actually circulated widely uh, through postcards and uh, has been reproduced uh, in many uh, different locations. Uh, another cartoon from that uh, from that time again, uh, looking at Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and so forth. Uh, Uncle Sam took teaching uh, the lessons of democracy and uh, self-government to the new uh, overseas possessions. Those were very uh, common uh, representations, uh, especially the idea that the, the new colonies were children that had to be taught by by Uncle Sam. Uh, now. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to emphasize from this period, of the sort of first uh, few years of the 20th century, is that from the beginning, legally speaking, Puerto Rico then was defined, and this is sort of the legal jargon from the U.S. Supreme Court, as a territory pertinent and belonging to the United States, but not a part of the United States. And that's, I think, where many of the discussions and the ambivalences about Puerto Rico's current status uh, come from. Also, the idea of Puerto Rico, and that's the way that it was spelled then, uh, after the, the, the U.S. invasion, Puerto Rico was foreign to the United States in a domestic sense um, because the island was not incorporated. And then eventually uh, the Supreme Court concluded that the American Constitution did not follow the flag, meaning that not all the rights and privileges of U.S. citizenship were automatically extended to U.S. citizens in Puerto Rico. Now, turning to the migration uh, issue, uh, again, during this period, it's very clear, and this is uh, another well-known uh, citation from the first uh, govern gov American governor of Puerto Rico, uh, who in 1901, in his first annual report, actually referred to the need to uh, begin thinking about migration. He didn't actually express a support for any particular migration policy, although, as you can tell, he, he's thinking about importing rather than, than exporting uh, migrants. Uh, but there's a situation uh, that, according to the colonial authorities, uh, looks like an overcrowded, overpopulated, uh, very small island that needs then to develop somehow by exporting uh, uh, its people. In 1904, uh, and, and this is a very important case from the insular cases, the Gonzalez versus Williams case, as you can tell from the headlines, uh, it, it's prior to uh, the extension of U.S. citizenship in 1917, and it refers to the case of Isabella Gonzalez, who in 1904 uh, sued the federal government and won the case. And the result was that Puerto Ricans were not considered uh, aliens for migration purposes since then. And therefore, that really begin, uh, begins to be uh, the, the, the key to the massive movement uh, to, uh, to the United States from Puerto Rico, even though, of course, the 1917 decision to extend U.S. citizenship, citizenship further promoted it. So uh, colonial migration policies can be clearly established at least from 1915 15, when Governor Arthur Yeager uh, established that the only really effective way to solve the population problem in Puerto Rico was to sponsor migration. Some other region, at this point it wasn't very clear where, it could have been Santo Domingo, it could have been Cuba, it could have been Brazil, but in the end it was of course <coughs> mostly uh, the United States. Uh, Senator Luis Muñoz Marin, who later became governor, as many of you, of you know, was also involved in discussions much later, three decades later, uh, which uh, led him to believe that migration was necessary as a measure to relief, uh, to provide some sort of re relief to surplus population. And these were very uh, confidential discussions at the time in the 1940s, but eventually they did become uh, a policy, uh, first by the colonial uh, government in Puerto Rico and later by the Estado Social. And then another uh, fellow who was very important during this um, uh, discussion was an economist, a uh, U.S. economist working for the office of Puerto Rico in Washington, who in 1947, a memorandum to uh, Munoz Marin, uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, said said what, what needed to be said, which was that migration was uh, necessary in order to promote economic development uh, on the island. That there was no way that the island would develop without uh, getting rid of some of that excess population. 
then uh, the other thing that's, I think, important to, to remember is that the uh, colonial government, as well as the so-called post-colonial government, the Commonwealth government after 1952, established a number of offices here in the United States, beginning with the Bureau of Employment and Identification, 1930s, the Office of Information for Puerto Rico in 1940s, and the Bureau of Employment and Migration, which became the predecessor to the uh, uh, later uh, uh, established with a different name, the Migration Division of the Department of Labor of, of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, which was really the one who uh, spurred the migration and organized the migration throughout most of the period of high migration, 1940s through uh, 1980. Now, since 1917, after uh, Puerto Ricans uh, were uh, declared to be US citizens, uh, then we begin to see a growing movement, mostly of agricultural workers, uh, cane workers in particular, women who uh, were employed by the uh, needlework industry, uh, uh, blacks as well as whites, large families uh, from the, uh, this is uh, the last picture is from Calle, I believe, from the uh, inner highlands of the region, the coffee region and the tobacco regions and so forth. So we begin to see a, a mass movement develop during uh, this period. It doesn't really take off after World War II, but clearly during this time, uh, the seeds were, were, were sown for this massive uh, diaspora after World War II. And it's right after World War II in 1947 when uh, the Puerto Rican government, not the Commonwealth government, the colonial government, uh, established Public Law 25, which as you can tell, uh, gives the, 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 the main con contours of um, uh, colon the colonial policy toward migration. It's a laissez-faire migration, at least in principle. It doesn't stimulate or discourage migration. Uh, the other thing is, uh, but, but it does uh, say, uh, you know, expressly that it would help the migrants to adapt and adjust to uh, their life in the United States. What's interesting about this quote, too, is the word foreign country, and the other one, which may have been developed by anthropologists, I don't know, ethnolog ethnologically strange studies. Because even though, again, it's a colonial government, it still considers uh, the United States different from uh, Puerto Rico in, in cultural terms or ethnological terms. And in fact, throughout uh, the <coughs> 1940s and up till the 1980s, much of the activity of the Migration Division is based on that, that premise, that Puerto Ricans are linguistically and culturally different from their fellow citizens, citizens in the United States, and therefore so the Migration Division has to do something like, for example, translate and represent the Puerto Rican community vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the general public in the United States. And then uh, the other part of that uh, law that I want to uh, highlight is that the idea of following its migrant citizens, uh, that, that somehow it's a duty, uh, as the, the prior quotes uh, states, uh, that the, the Puerto Rican government uh, established itself clearly in those places where uh, Puerto Ricans are settling down during that time. And therefore, there will be a number of offices uh, in New York, of course, but also Philadelphia, Chicago, uh, Boston, uh, in Orlando later on, uh, in order to, to promote uh, the adjustment of uh, Puerto Ricans in the United States. Note that the quote does not uh, talk about assimilation, which is interesting, I think, because at that time, assimilation was already discredited as a way to promote the so-called adjustment and adaptation. Uh, so, <coughs> after 1952, then, uh, with the establishment of, of Commonwealth, you have what's really the most important uh, government office here, the Migration Division of the Department of Labor, which was established in 1950 and uh, was active all throughout uh, the 1980s. Uh, a brief period uh, of time, uh, the last, last slide, part of the slide actually, in which this office was named the Puerto Rican <coughs> Department of Puerto Rican Community Affairs in the United States. It was very short-lived. And uh, still standing is the Puerto Rican Federal Affairs Administration, which took over some of the functions <coughs> of the Department of Puerto Rican Affairs. But as some of you know, this office has been downsized tremendously with very little resources and doesn't really have the kind of uh, agenda that it used to have during the height of the uh, Great Migration. In fact, right now it doesn't seem clear that Puerto Rican government has any stance, any policy toward migration. Uh, they simply ignore it uh, in, in general sense, in a general way. And again, going back to the less fair stance, uh, letting people go uh, if they want to. I should I should know that it's very difficult to quantify uh, migration from Puerto Rico to the United States, and I'll just give you some of the uh, standard uh, figures. They're also on the paper. Uh, because Puerto Ricans are U.S. citizens and because there's no legal border that divides the island from the mainland, uh, there's no control over migration uh, except for foreign immigrants who come mostly from the Dominican Republic. But a Puerto Rican doesn't really have, need a passport or visa, as, as many of you know. Um, so that means that the numbers are, are unreliable. 
Uh, they're based, based on passenger movement, uh, the number of people come in, and the number of people who go out. There are other ways of trying to figure out exactly how many people we're talking about. So I wouldn't defend the, the, the reliability of these numbers, but I think that the patterns are pretty clear. And here, as you can tell, there are basically two peaks in migration, the 1940s and 50s, the so-called Great Migration, where more than uh, 500,000 people uh, are estimated to have left the island for the United States. Then there's a, 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 a dramatic decrease during the 1970s and a resurgence of the massive movement in the 1980s and 90s. Uh, and we still don't know what's going to happen during this decade. It looks like there's also uh, a movement, a growing movement of people from uh, the island because of the economic recession, the economic <coughs> shutdown, uh, and so forth. So I think what's interesting is that, uh, in fact, some uh, scholars had predicted that Puerto Rican migration would, would have ended by the 1970s, that somehow uh, it would happen like with the Italians or other groups who had come to this country, or the Irish, for example, uh, because the island had developed. But then something happened, and I want to go back to that during the 1980s and 90s, which, of course, uh, led to another uh, wave of, 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 of people uh, probably uh, overcoming and surpassing the prior so-called great migration. <coughs> The other way to look at this is, of course, and perhaps more in a more reliable way, is to look at census data on the number of Puerto Ricans living in the U.S. compared to the number of people living in Puerto Rico, which also includes some uh, non-Puerto Ricans like uh, Dominicans and Cubans. But in any case, uh, you, you can tell what's happened. After 1940s and 50s, the number of Puerto Ricans in the U.S. really begins to grow uh, in a significant way. And by the year 2006, for the first time, the U.S. Census estimated that there were more people of Puerto Rican origin living in the United States than in Puerto Rico. Uh, and that's quite uh, dramatic uh, and something that uh, has rarely happened, uh, even within the context of the Caribbean, which has a very large uh, number of people in the diaspora. Okay, let's go back. Okay, so I was trying to, let me go back to the last slide. Uh, basically, that slide was, you know, sort of giving you the historical background, uh, the demographic growth of the Puerto Rican diaspora. This one uh, is based on a different uh, source. It's on the American Community Survey that asked everyone in the United States where that person was living last year. So it's, it's a little more accurate, I think, and it gives you a sense of, of what's happening now, although, again, you see ups and downs. But, but clearly, I think, especially the last two or three years with the growing economic uh, difficulties in Puerto Rico, uh, I think we're in the presence of a new uh, massive movement that may again, rival the prior uh, movement. Mm -hmm. So then just a few images of, of that uh, prior movement uh, after World War II. This is a famous photograph from Jack, Jack Delano, uh, of people uh, saying wives and relatives uh, coming to the United States. Another image by Jack Delano, the revolving door, I told it, he closed that. In fact, I wasn't really sure if this was coming or going. And it's part of the idea of the revolving door uh, metaphor that uh, sometime uh, during the 19, a little later than this, actually during the 1960s and, se and 70s, more people actually began to go back to Puerto Rico than uh, leave the island. Since then, uh, the movement has been overwhelmingly in this direction rather than back, uh, back home. Uh, this, is, this image, I think, is interesting because of what is still happening. The, the, the U.S. Customs Service Agricultural uh, Inspection uh, uh, in, in San Juan, this is an image actually of Isla Grande, but it's also happening in the uh, this Muñoz Marine Airport. And it's one of the differences in terms of traveling between Puerto Rico and the United States that doesn't apply to traveling within uh, the continental United States. In any case, I think it, it does uh, make a difference in terms of what people actually uh, go through when they're moving uh, abroad. And then on the other hand, this is an image of uh, the Puerto Rican government uh, representative receiving uh, Puerto Rican uh, passengers in New York. So again, on both ends, you have this kind of coordination of uh, uh, the, the, the U.S. government inspection uh, agency as well as the Commonwealth government. And then uh, the Commonwealth government of Puerto Rico, especially through the Migration Office uh, that was established in New York and other places throughout the mainland, really uh, tried to sponsor migration, uh, to plan it, to organize it, to coordinate it, to make life easier for their migrants, uh, and of course they're wearing their powers and so on uh, there. Uh, Muñoz Marín, who was governor of Puerto Rico during all this uh, uh, high period of migration from 1940s to uh, the 1960s, gave a very interesting speech here in New York City in 1958, in which he said that he was basically the first New Yorker, that he was the first uh, return migrant, uh, uh, and, uh, and of course he was very uh, careful about what, what uh, he said during that speech. He said, I hope someday you will go back too, like me, and be a return migrant. Not now, things are not 
still good anymore. But eventually, he, he did foresee a future in which <coughs> Puerto Ricans who had to, to leave the country would go back uh, and then reincorporate in themselves into their uh, homeland. Now, uh, this is a section on the uh, farm labor uh, program. I just want to say a few things that I think are significant within, again, that uh, sort of issue as to whether Puerto Ricans uh, can be considered colonial or post-colonial migrants. The first thing is that, uh, look for example at the brochure, the U.S. the Puerto Rican government is telling the U.S. Uh, government as well as uh, private uh, recruiters how to hire agricultural workers, in other words, from Puerto Rico, uh, and telling them all sorts of things like, for example, you can't do it on your own, you have to do it through us, you have to sign a contract with the Puerto Rican government, and I'll uh, mention that uh, uh, a little later as well. Um, Los tomateros is the word that became sort of the, the general uh, buzzword to describe the tomato tomato uh, pickers, but also they, they did all kinds of things. They picked uh, apples in Maine and in Washington State uh, and oranges in Florida uh, and all kinds of uh, different things. But as I'll show you in a moment, they did concentrate in the Northeast, especially in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. And this image to me, which has been reproduced again in several different publications, is very significant because of the fact that they were using old World War II uh, he commissioned uh, airplanes with no uh, windows and no real chairs uh, and of course these were extremely long um, and difficult uh, travels. Public Law 87 in 1947 established again that only the, 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 the Commonwealth government, the Korean government first and then the Commonwealth government later, uh, was in charge of, of representing farm workers vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, <coughs> investors. And there were a lot of legal actions, actually, uh, throughout the whole, the whole period of high migration in which the Commonwealth, Commonwealth government saw itself as, as the legal representative of the um, interest of, of farm workers. And again, just to give you a, a sense of where they, they settled, uh, New, New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut were the first uh, three states, but also Delaware, Pennsylvania, and other states. The working conditions and the uh, sleeping arrangements in particular, as well as the food, in many of the documents that I that I looked at here at the center, uh, one of the basic complaints was that there was no real good food, especially not no no hot food. For example, the American um, um, employers would give them soup, and for the Puerto Ricans, that was no good. They had to have arroz y habichuelas, something real, more substantial. Uh, also, of course, they uh, they weren't uh, really treated like they were expected to be to be treated uh, by uh, by these uh, investors. Um, all kinds of complaints about salary deductions, uh, about uh, uh, long hours, and uh, all kinds of things that are clearly documented in uh, the archives. The other interesting thing is that uh, the, the Puerto Rican government in Puerto Rico uh, developed a number of programs like this one, uh, the Programa Educativo Recreativo, or Recreational Educational Program, for the children of Puerto Rican migrants uh, who were coming and going uh, at the time, which were significant, not any longer, uh, and so we have a whole, at least two generations actually of, of, of migrant children who benefited from these kinds of educational uh, initiatives. Uh, very few of them actually uh, now uh, in Puerto Rico uh, in that situation. So what's the importance of the farm labor program and how, how does this uh, throw any light on the question of post-colonial or colonial uh, status of uh, Puerto Ricans? First of all, the, the sheer size of it. Uh, even though uh, we know much more about the Bracero program, the Mexican Bracero program, <coughs> during this time in the Southwest, which is much larger, this really is the second largest number of agricultural workers that was imported to uh, the United States during the, the period of, the, of after World War II. The second, uh, I think, uh, important aspect to, to underline is that it really combined a number of colonial and post-colonial practices, as I already mentioned before, especially the fact that they had to work, the migration office had to work within the confines of the federal law, any rules and regulations that the US uh, uh, um, government uh, developed had to be observed by the Commonwealth government. But at the same time, they had their own laws, the Commonwealth government uh, did and, and had its own practice, uh, its own personnel, and its own uh, initiatives for agricultural work. So it's really a, a fascinating mixture of what I'm calling here colonial and post-colonial. And uh, uh, moreover, uh, going back to that old legal doctrine of considering Puerto Ricans domestic but foreign, I think in, in many ways um, that phrase resonates with, uh, with many of the uh, internal uh, operations of the Migration Division, and particularly with the Farm Labor Program. They did want to argue that Puerto Ricans were legally domestic because that meant that they had uh, a high priority 
to be recruited than Jamaicans or Mexicans or other foreign workers. But at the same time, they insisted that they needed a special treatment because their culture or the language was different than were Puerto Rican. Um, these are the beginnings of uh, circular migration of Elmo. At the time, we didn't really have that, that language. Uh, we didn't call it the Vaivain as we do now. Uh, but, but really the fact that it was a seasonal movement that every year people would come for three or four years and go back to Puerto Rico. Uh, and, and many uh, workers did that uh, for, for, for a number of years. Uh, where are the, the, the uh, origins of what, what now we call circular migration? Uh, and, and finally, too, um, uh, the, the beginning of many diaspora communities where uh, after finishing their contracts, Puerto Rican workers would then settle and bring their relatives and develop larger communities in places like Philadelphia, for example, or Hartford, Connecticut, or Miami, Florida, or places in the Midwest. So then uh, this is the next section that deals with the geographic distribution of Puerto Ricans in the U.S. after the the 1940s, uh, and to begin with sort of the more recent situation, again, you see concentrations uh, on, in, along the Northeast Coast, in Florida, the Midwest, and some more scattered communities, and out West, uh, California, and Texas, for example. Uh, this map comes from uh, Angelo Falcon, who uh, described very well the changing patterns, and of course, there's so many arrows in many directions that it's kind of difficult to describe exactly what's going on. But one of the things that clear, clear, clearly going on is that uh, as people are, are, are moving from the island to the mainland, others are moving back to the island, as well as uh, within the United States, especially uh, one of the arrows here down to Florida. So uh, the, the movements of Puerto Ricans have become more complicated. I think that's what the map basically illustrates. And the other thing that's also interesting uh, from that report by, by Angelo Falcon is that the, the number of Puerto Ricans that, that are increasing in some states, like places like Georgia, uh, North Carolina, uh, Virginia, which were practically unknown as Puerto Rican communities, actually have the highest percentage of increase uh, in the United States. And of course, uh, the other thing that's not surprising to you here is that New York doesn't really come up in the map. It still has the largest number of Puerto Ricans in the United States, but it's the only state that actually lost uh, some of its Puerto Rican population during the 1990s. And then the other part of the story is Florida, right? At uh, least a quarter million uh, Puerto Ricans was there uh, during the 1990s. And according to the figure that I'll show you in a moment, they're still going there. They're going to Central Florida in particular in larger numbers than anywhere else. Another way to, to sort of uh, picture the, uh, the changing movements is to see, again, New York has uh, sort of uh, stagnated in terms of the number of Puerto Ricans uh, uh, over the last couple of decades. New Jersey uh, has, has increased but has lost its second place to New York, which is now uh, in Florida. Uh, and then uh, Pennsylvania is increasing but not as much as other state, states, particularly uh, in the South. So you see a rearrangement, a redistribution of the Puerto Rican population uh, in the United States, uh, especially from, from outside New York uh, and other places in the North, Northeast. And this is the figure that I wanted to, to show you uh, that I said before. Orange County in Florida, as well as Osceola County, uh, basically that's the Orlando metropolitan area, has really attracted, uh, has, has become the magnet for recent Puerto Rican migrants, more than 30,000, uh, according to the US uh, Census have moved there uh, in this decade. Uh, and then there are other places in Florida, like Miami, like Broward, which is Fort Lauderdale, uh, Tampa, which is basically Hillsboro, and then places like New Haven, Connecticut, which is not really that big, but still is attracting a significant number of uh, Puerto Ricans, and places in uh, Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, Connecticut as well. The leading metropolitan area for Puerto Ricans continues to be uh, New York City with uh, roughly 800,000 people, but the second largest one is already Orlando, which was not even in the map for many Puerto Ricans uh, before 1990. Then Miami, then Philadelphia, and Chicago. So there's been a significant uh, change in the distribution of Puerto Ricans in the United States. These are just some, some images that, uh, in fact, uh, remind us that New York uh, had a very important uh, uh, place within the uh, 1940s migration, especially El Harlem Boricua, or the Hispanic Barrio par excellence, is a quote from an article from 1950. And of course, something that you are well aware of, I'm sure, is that El Barrio has been changing its demographic composition. This is from 2000, uh, the latest census. Uh, Puerto Ricans were a slight majority, 58%, but all Latinos in the area, but Mexicans, Dominicans, and other groups have uh, increased their presence. And by the year 2010, there'll probably be a minority, and that has all kinds of implications. The Bronx, uh, however, continues to be the largest uh, co concentration of Puerto Ricans in the world, I would say. It even has more Puerto Ricans than 
than places in San Juan, certainly, uh, and uh, and then therefore uh, has uh, that kind of central place within the Puerto Rican diaspora. So the last part, part of the presentation uh, that I hope to finish in a few minutes is to just illustrate a number of transnational cultural practices. What do I mean by transnational? I'm using it, the term in a broad sense, uh, re referring to the way in which Puerto Ricans, like many other migrants, uh, continue to have strong ties, cultural ties, economic, political, uh, social, and family ties uh, with their communities of origin. And they, uh, they bring them to the United States as well as send them back. Although I, I won't have much to say about the remittances, the cultural remittances, that's something that one point is again that I mentioned before has worked uh, with, uh, on recently. Interestingly, the first uh, w known Puerto Rican club, uh, migrant club in, in, in the United States is in San Francisco, uh, not in New York, uh, and it's still uh, functioning with the Puerto Rican de San Francisco, 1912. It seems to be part of the movement to Hawaii, and many of you know that many Puerto Ricans decided actually to stay in San Francisco or in New Orleans rather than go on and make the trip. So it's a small but historically uh, significant community, and almost everywhere uh, that Puerto Ricans went where they, they established some sort of a voluntary association. As far as I know, the oldest one of these hometown clubs is the Cabo Rojeños Ausentes, which was founded in 1922. There are many others, the Alcanos Ausentes. Uh, for every municipio of San Juan, there might be two or three of these clubes. Uh, and of course, they're very important for many purposes, uh, including the organizing of the Puerto Rican community. Other kinds of broader uh, associations like this one, the Liga Puerto Riqueña a Hispana, it's interesting that uh, the term Hispano is already being used. It wasn't created or invented by the sense of these Puerto Ricans who are calling themselves Hispano. Uh, you wonder who the other Hispanos were. They're probably Cuban, Spanish, Dominican, uh, but mostly Puerto Ricans uh, in the 1920s. And then uh, an interesting image, I think, from 1924, and it's very early, uh, which shows, of course, the interest on, on uh, in baseball and the fact that these are transnational baseball clubs because one of them is based here in, in New York. They were coming from San Juan and they have already organized this sort of uh, friendly rivalry between the island and the mainland. This uh, menu uh, is interesting for a number of reasons. Uh, among them, well, you can, you can look at some of the things that they were eating, uh, uh, chicken soup and arroz con pollo and steak. And, and then there's uh, something about the drinking uh, thing be because, of course, it was illegal at the time, and you can imagine that uh, any Puerto Rican uh, party without something to drink is not a real party. And then, of course, the bodegas and grocery stores that were established uh, in Brooklyn and in, in the Bronx and Manhattan, uh, which were very important not only for the small uh, business development of the community, but also for the social uh, networks. The parade, uh, which uh, was established in the 1950s, and the idea of having beauty queens elected, uh, representing the community uh, continues to be very strong. The botanica, the uh, folk, uh, uh, popular uh, religion, religious uh, stores uh, in the barrio, like this one, Santa Barbara, uh, which of course later on catered not only to Puerto Ricans, but also to Dominicans and other Caribbean uh, immigrants. Uh, street altars and uh, popular uh, religious uh, practices, uh, uh, especially the Catholic ones, but also combining different uh, forms of cultural expression. Um, dominoes. Uh, this one, uh, Puerto Rico theory, bringing uh, again musicians and, and actors from Puerto Rico, which would have been well known, especially Agrelodi Vigoro, no? at the time, by any Puerto Rican here or there. The New Yorican Poets Cafe, which was established in the 1970s and which now has uh, even another New Yorican Poets Cafe in San Juan, so that seems to be a, a, this kind of cultural remittance that I talked about before. This fellow, a more recent uh, image that I uh, <coughs> scavenged from the internet, uh, it's saying basically, yo soy boricua, yo soy boricua, I am Puerto Rican, all over the place, uh, but he lives in New York. And of course, the New York uh, parade, which is probably the, the single largest uh, event in which uh, Puerto Rican identities are uh, publicly performed, both for the community as well as for everyone else who cares to, to watch. The flag, which is all over the place, uh, in people's bodies and uh, tattoos and, and so on. And then just to um, give you some sense of the other uh, Puerto Rican communities, I think the Chicago uh, uh, situation is very interesting, especially Paseo Boricua, which is this mile long uh, street which, which is lined by a huge uh, Puerto Rican steel flag on both ends. Um, and, and here you might recognize the they run right in the middle with the, the flag of, of, of Lares and many other folk uh, characters. 
la casita de Don Pedro, which is right there uh, along the Paseo Boricua, I meaning Don Pedro and Lisa Campos, and of course that's a symbol of uh, strong nationalism within that community. Uh, and then <coughs> just a couple of images from Orlando. I thought uh, this one in particular was interesting to me because it's right in the middle of nowhere in a typical uh, central Florida uh, locale, but then the, the people who uh, uh, organized this Asociación Borin, Borin Kenya, which is a huge uh, club, has something like 2,000 members, uh, seem to have uh, felt the need to recreate it according to a moral standards, and that's what that, that looks like in a sort of Disney World uh, version of it. <laughs> <laughs> and the last uh, uh, slide, I think the last image is of course from the Orlando Puerto Rican Parade, which is now a very strong and very popular endeavor. This, uh, I think, is from the National Geographic. So people within that, that area are beginning to organize and again beginning to uh, uh, express themselves publicly and uh, having an impact, uh, especially in the cultural landscape, not still uh, very little uh, political uh, impact, but, but that will come because of the large number of people that I, that I show people. So to conclude then, um, I think going back to the question of colonial, post-colonial, there is, a, I think, a widespread agreement in Puerto Rico and the United States that Puerto Rico is still uh, a colony of the United States uh, with regard to most uh, standards uh, of, uh, of that term. Uh, the second point that I want to emphasize is that because in part of this colonial, long-standing colonial relationship between Puerto Rico and the United States, the uh, Puerto Rican diaspora continues and uh, has grown in size, uh, as I mentioned before, even displacing and, and becoming bigger than the Puerto Rican population on the island. In both cases, I see uh, strong expressions of national identities. Uh, I didn't, of course, uh, emphasize the part of Puerto Rico, but I think the, uh, there are parallel developments. Uh, both in, 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 in the mainland and uh, on the island, uh, in which uh, Puerto Rican identity is, is a clearly uh, being expressed uh, publicly um, in many uh, instances. The question of transnationalism that I also uh, wanted to uh, refer to, uh, again, if, to if you compare the Puerto Rican situation with the Dominican diaspora or the Cuban diaspora even, which has its own particularities, I think you could argue that uh, Puerto Ricans are doing the same thing. Uh, that other um, communities are doing, that is keeping their ties uh, with the homeland and, uh, and maintaining those ties through a circular migration, to, through uh, visiting patterns, uh, uh, telephone calls, and so forth. And uh, my, sort of my last uh, observation here has to do with uh, going back to the question that I started with in the subtitle. Uh, Puerto Rico, uh, in, this, in this regard, with regard to, to migration, really occupies a middle ground, sort of an ambiguous space. It does have some elements of what could be called post-colonial migration that I referred to before, but it really, again, within the colonial status of Puerto Rico, uh, is, is, is uh, clearly also uh, uh, an expression of colonial migrant. Uh, and finally, uh, the, the, that, that phrase that seems to haunt Puerto Rico and Puerto Ricans in the United States, you know, uh, Puerto Ricans still uh, for in a domestic sense, or to quote Willie Colón, who says that Puerto Ricans are legal uh, aliens, I think the, the sense of uh, still being a part of, but, but not really belonging to, or rather the other way around, of the United States still uh, defines uh, Puerto Ricans on the island and the United States, and certainly the migration process that continues today. So thank you very much. definition of what that means. And I know you've written extensively about this. I just want to make sure that, that I get it. Colonial and... Well, you, know, you, you talk about colonial, post-colonial, and then trans... And your answer seems to be that with transnational, that we... That vagus space that you talk about, it's really transnational. We are in both places, and that there are some ties. And then you define those ties in a particular way. I just want to clarify that. Should we go around and pick up... A that's your choice. Yeah. I have I'm something else that's more of a common observation. Okay. So Hi, um, I really enjoyed your presentation in the paper. Um, my comment actually follows up on yours. Um, because I think there's two things happening, well, there's many things happening in the presentation, but for me they cluster in two areas. One has to do with um, the case study of the complexity around political colonization 
Puerto Rico and using the worker program and the way the pilgrims and migration do that. I'm really curious about veterans as a group, um, very tightly, well documented, visually well documented in terms of paperwork, easy to interview, to talk about a, a real choke point in some of those contradictions. Um, so I guess I'm sort of have ideas about how to tease out the colonial from the transnational. So the colonial side seems really tightly tied to a U.S. island set of relationships. I think veterans would be a really interesting group to focus on, to heighten and, and really force some of those contradictions to either resolve or fall apart. On the other end is the more transnational disputes set of practices, of educations, set of formations, and I, I see that's a place where in, in my own work on the near community in the 20s and 30s, transnationalism means something very different. It means almost a <coughs> Latin. It's transnational, but it's not focused on the U.S. government. It's focused on Spanish speakers, peace movement, feminism. So it's a transnationalism that that is very multi-sided. <coughs> there's a kind of solidarity <coughs> contra, you know, Anglo-Sajones, white folks, El Norte. It's a, it's transnational, but its its orientation is very distinct. But yet, of course, this all happens at the same time, right? In terms of citizenship is happening, migration is happening. So these sort of legalistic bodies moving, paperwork happening sides of the relationship are going on. And then there's this other set of transnational happenings that are where the United States is a little bit in the background, and but a very vibrant set of transnational practice among Spanish speakers is, you know, so I just, just kind of throw that out because um, uh, I think women have a really important part in maintaining some of those cultural, spiritual, religious, artistic side of it. And so there might be a gendered component to, to, to both of these aspects, this sort of tight, sort of old-style colonialism, if you will, and then this looser, more multi-sided mm -hmm. set of transnational considerations. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I want to recognize and thanks to my students from Rogers University in New Jersey to be here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's a long uh, to be here. Uh, I just want to... Uh, Take a great lecture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good <laughs> one. Uh, what was the, the reaction to their post-colonial post -colonial, uh, migration uh, in, in Puerto Rico? Uh, uh, this term, you know, this term is very uh, politically sided. <laughs> and, and, and what was the reaction? Well, you have, I, I, I read your article in I said post colonial because El Ella people said that we are not a color. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed the presentation and I think um, comparing the transnational experience, highlighting the role of organization. I think it's really important. I don't think I've done been done enough in looking at the Puerto Rican migration and the cultural remittances. But if you look at kind of other transnationalism, there are two areas where there may be some evidence. Uh, but not maybe as full-blown. One is the political transnationalism. If you look, for example, at the Mexican and Dominican cases, people emphasize a lot the kind of political involvement and engagement of the diaspora. <coughs> I'd like you perhaps to kind of compare uh, or, 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 or think about whether there are elements of that comparison in the Puerto Rican case and whether that may have even changed over time. I know I've this were very important back when. I don't know how important they are now, but I certainly know that Gutierrez, Serrano, and Velasquez are important somehow, so maybe there's something there. But it's not like grassroots as much as in the Mexican or Dominican cases were. And the second is the economic piece. I mean, I think a lot of the Mexican, Dominican, other transnational groups have a lot of power or importance because they kind of invest in the in the economic infrastructure, in the business infrastructure. I don't know how much in the Puerto Rican case, even though Angelo suggested about a billion dollars in remittances, in the large scheme of things, I don't know how important that is and whether you think that that has any implications for how we understand the kind of Puerto Rican transnational experiences and some of its similarities and differences with, with others. And thank you for a great presentation. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, <coughs> uh, for, for, actually, the issue about the veterans is actually like really important. 
and at some point someone should do a study about well it, it yeah it would really highlight for example the contrast between Mexican American strategies in the same time period and going to the future and and but also how that also affects what goes on on the island politically and culturally um, but the thing I wanted to bring up was the issue of language I mean to what extent is the language going to going to ultimately decide what actually happens to the diaspora but at some point you know, it's like going to Puerto Rico, you speak Spanish. I mean, it's, it's just people might speak English, they speak English badly, but, you know, they speak Spanish. And over here, you know, a lot of, I don't know what the numbers are like, but the diaspora, is, if you ask them to speak Spanish, as a whole, it, it's not really going to happen too much. You know, I mean, I'm talking about like the younger generation and growing up. So at what point does the, the issue of language going to separate the diaspora from the island to the extent that you know, someone's going to make the, come to the conclusion that, well, it's like Puerto Rican American as opposed to Puerto Rican. Then my counter was going in that direction, so then how you respond to it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, interesting questions. Uh, five or six different presentations that we have to give. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in, in the order that I, that I wrote them, uh, I think, it would be interesting to, to develop the argument that Puerto Rico is a colonial transnational nation. And of course, there are so many terms there that uh, you need to spell, spell out all these different ones, right? And what that implies. But I'm, I'm concerned especially with the fact, uh, as I mentioned, that much of the, the work on transnational migration uh, assumes that uh, uh, these practices and these relationships, relationships take place between two separate nation states, right? Uh, and then basically uh, within that scheme, Puerto Rico has no place. But then, and I think here, for example, Ramon Grospogel has argued, I think uh, persuasively, that if you look at Puerto Rico in the comparative situation of the Caribbean, especially with the Dutch Caribbean and the French Caribbean, something similar, although each case is, is different, uh, may take place within the colonial metropolitan uh, network. Mm -hmm. And so in that regard, it, it's transnational because it takes place between, between two spaces that uh, I think it's, uh, you know, you can argue are, are different nation, national formations, but they're not different states, right? They're, one of them is, in this case, the colonial state is part of the other. So I want to argue that. I mean, I want to develop that. I still don't have all the answers, but I think uh, there may be a different type of transnationalism then that takes place within a colonial uh, situation that is different from, uh, and again, the, the, the Mexican situation or the Dominican situation. Uh, for example, uh, clearly the Migration Division uh, sought to, to replace uh, uh, the embassies or the consulates no, that uh, nation states uh, have in the United States. So in the absence of, of, an, of an organized diplomatic representation, these people actually thought of themselves as, as consuls of some kind of, or, or representatives of the Puerto Rican uh, uh, community in the United States. And they did all kinds of practical things to, to develop that uh, public relations uh, campaigns. Uh, uh, people who were writing all the time, no? and these letters, some of them are, are here in the archives, uh, uh, migrant workers who are writing to the Puerto Rican government to, to uh, solve all kinds of problems, uh, personal problems, and so forth, in, in very uh, similar situations uh, in which other uh, uh, foreign citizens would would, uh, um, would try to use their, their own uh, nation states uh, in that way. So that's what I would say right now, although I know it's, it's sort of a, a work in progress. I don't, I don't know about veterans. Uh, I confess uh, that I haven't looked at that situation. I do know it's important that it's an estimate of perhaps some 200,000 Puerto Ricans who have been uh, in the military uh, since 1917, uh, huge uh, proportion of, of people. Uh, the connection between uh, participating in, in the U.S. Uh, armed forces and migrating is, is very clear uh, if you look at the biographies of uh, many people who came to the United States or perhaps to places like Panama or Germany uh, who moved first and then later that became part of a, a constant movement. But I, I don't know really uh, what to do with it except that I agree with, uh, with you that, that somebody should study it. Uh, maybe you're, you're doing it already. Um, but I, I don't know particularly what would, uh, what would happen if you, if you look at that situation in more depth. Um, 
I agree too that uh, the, the kind of transnationalism that developed in the early colonial so the community is more of pan Latino or pan ethnic, and one of the images that the Liga Puerto Rican Hispana sort of hints at that. Uh, but I think also uh, uh, later on it, it changes, uh, especially after the Puerto Rican uh, movement sort of becomes a very the largest one uh, in the 1940s and 50s. The Cuban migration really uh, um, comes to, to an end during that period uh, up until 1959. So that being Latino and Hispanic in New York meant being Puerto Rican at that time, right? Of course, now it's more complicated, and then perhaps now we're seeing uh, a new form of transnationalism in which you have some sort of uh, negotiation between Puerto Rican identity, Hispanic identity, Latinos identities, and all the other groups. Uh, but, but yes, I was uh, more interested in the kinds of transnationalism that takes place within the sending country and the receiving country in, in this case. And there's no doubt that, there, that this is a gendered uh, component. Uh, as you were saying, uh, the role of women, uh, I was thinking particularly of the work of Maria Licea and Maura Torre and others who have worked with uh, how, uh, uh, particularly Puerto Rican women move back and forth between the island and the mainland to take care of children, to take care of older uh, persons, to take care of people who are sick, uh, to attend to funerals. So, and perhaps these are not long-term movement, but clearly the, the kind of kinship work and the emotional work that's uh, uh, strongly gendered uh, seems to be the, the sort of the infrastructure for this kind of connection, the transnational connection, and I, I think that should be emphasized as well. Reaction to post-colonial migration, there was none because uh, uh, this was presented. This paper was presented in, in a faraway place in, 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 in Amsterdam last semester. Um, but I agree with you that the term post-colonial is very uh, loaded, right? And it doesn't really, within the discussion of Puerto Rican, uh, the Puerto Rican status issue doesn't ring a bell, and most people, again, would say post-colonial. What does that mean? Uh, and that reminded me of, of a few years ago when we had a um, a Congress of the American Ethnological Society in Puerto Rico where they wanted to use the term post-colonial. And I objected it because of the fact that I thought it would have been sort of uh, offensive to many people in Puerto Rico to use uh, that term in that context. But in this connection, I think it, it does sort of at least made me think about uh, some of the issues. Uh, um, perhaps not post-colonial, perhaps light colonial, perhaps neo-colonial, I don't know, different words to describe what's going on because clearly there's a I think there's a, there's a break between 19, 19, the early part of the century and the second part of the century with regard to some of the issues that I was talking about. Um, the role of organizations, uh, I, I think, uh, were you thinking about hometown associations in particular? Yeah. There's no evidence, for example, that uh, at, at this point, uh, hometown associations, Puerto Rican uh, hometown associations, are sending back collective remittances, for example, which is, which is I think, what's been better documented in the Mexican case and some other places. So it, it may have been the case before. And I found some reference, for example, in the farm labor's uh, uh, pro farm labor program archives that Puerto Ricans were sending millions of dollars uh, at that time. But as the program came to an end in the late 1970s, then remittances did not really uh, play a significant role uh, as they do in the case of Mexico and the Dominican Republic. I know that Angelo Falcon has uh, this uh, $1 billion estimate. The official estimates uh, that the Puerto Rican Planning Board offers are about half a million. Uh, so that compared to half a billion, $500 million. Uh, so compared to uh, federal transfers, you know, which are $9 billion or something like that every year, or compared to the billions of dollars that Mexicans send back home, this is really peanuts. But um, in any case, and then that's, that's sort of the, the main question. What is it about the Puerto Rican situation that, that seems to be an exception, not only to the Mexican, but almost everyone within the Central America and the Caribbean region uh, is sending tremendous amounts of money. Um, so uh, I've, I've worked on that, and I know you've read some of that stuff, so I'll leave it at that. Um, language is, is crucial. I have a, a small section in the paper which, where I refer to language, um, but but it needs more development. I think that uh, um, clearly there's, there's a, ling a linguistic divide between Puerto Ricans in the US and Puerto Ricans uh, in Puerto Rico to the, to the extent that Spanish prevails there and English prevails here. But, uh, but of course there's a lot of bilingualism, there's a lot of code switching, and, uh, and then when we turn migration then for, for the first time, I mean, uh, you begin to hear people in Walmart and places like that in Puerto Rico speaking English, and then you look at them and they're not tourists. You know, so 
uh, that kind of uh, uh, linguistic uh, shift, I think, uh, hasn't been well documented in Puerto Rico. And then to the extent that people are, people are migrating here, then of course these are predominantly Spanish speakers that are sort of always uh, sort of infusing their own uh, linguistic practices into the community. So uh, my point, I guess, would be that the, the, the division between the linguistic division between the two places is not so clear cut uh, as perhaps it was uh, a long time ago. Uh, but at the same time, I recognize, and I think your your point is well taken, that language continues to be a point of contestation, and it's probably the one thing that, that divides the so-called uh, Puerto Ricans from the island from the so-called Puerto Ricans, right? And that can become a whole uh, um, hotly contested issue. I, I well, yeah. Sure. I apologize for being late, but as you were speaking and people are commenting, it occurs to me that um, I remember hearing the term transculturalism used in reference to the West Indian um, migration um, in Brooklyn to describe the relationship from this immigrant community with the various islands. And it was very, very, um, um, clearly defined as one that would be a sustaining political um, connection, uh, financial, and cultural. And that particular community, however, was not migrating to a colonial power, mm -hmm. it was migrating to another colonial power where the language is different and the issue of nationalism and the identity were different. Do you see any, any relationship or any Thing that is comparable to the Puerto Rican community in that sense. Relationship between the Puerto Rican community and We're between that kind of migration from the Caribbean, okay. from uh, from the West Indian countries, and Puerto Rico, would there be more similarities between them as either post-colonial or neo-colonial um, migration, uh, and in comparison to the Cuban migration, as a matter of fact, that. There is a difference between the relationship between the migrants and the, the, the country of origin. Yeah, um, I just want to know, uh, okay. like your opinion about uh, when in Puerto Rico, the government said that migration was necessary. What What is your thought about that? What is your opinion uh, transporting us to, to those times, in mean, those times? Was necessary in the <coughs> Yeah, my, my question really is related to that. And uh, it's mainly about, you know, the Munoz times and the promotion of migration. And was there any recognition of a conflict between the promotion of migration and any sense of nationalism? Can I connect that with rates of natural increase of population? That is, rates of increase in population, lowering of the death rates and a constant birth rate. What happened in Puerto Rico then? in the Munoz era and today. What connection is there between population, development, resource development, resource availability to maintain a changing population? The, the, you may have data in here or somewhere about the population of Puerto Rico uh, at the turn of the century, mid-century, end of century. It would be interesting to analyze that and what implications that has for migration. And why was there migration to the United States? What happened in the United States that uh, facilitated or permitted or uh, I'm not sure if it was welcomed, but certainly why to the United States? Why not to Brazil, uh, somewhere else? The British, uh, the British Commonwealth. Yeah, Jorge, um, one, one of the things that I've, I've observed, um, I, I have recent uh, uh, family migration 
from Puerto Rico to, to South Florida. And it's a very interesting dynamic because people that are just arriving in the last few years and sort of their view of having to deal with, with incorporation into the United States, people who have always seen themselves identified as, as Americans, uh, you know, it, on the island and now are having to deal with a, a very different sort of dynamics in, in South Florida. One of the things that I've observed, and this is ob obviously a very popular and personal observation, is some of the ways that particular class and racial antagonisms from the island are being reproduced in South Florida with, 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 uh, um, uh, with uh, 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 in terms of different spaces. The ways in Puerto Rico, the way we identify particular spaces as working class spaces, I see that being reproduced in Orlando, for example, in certain uh, neighborhoods, uh, certain shopping centers. Certain people in, in Orlando say, don't go to Kissimmee because Kissimmee has this particular type of Puerto Ricans. So, I mean, I, I don't know if you've come across in your, in your work about some of, uh, of some of these antagonisms that, that I, at least I have seen and, 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 and hear a lot of comments about when I'm in South Florida. Well, yeah, um, I think mine is more of a kind of philosophical question, but I think part of the, of the difficulty that I have with the application of these terms, transnationalism and so forth, is a little bit of the change reality that, that I think the literature, Puerto Rican studies as a field, hasn't really caught up with. Let me, let me try to explain that, which is to say, that you know, the majority of Puerto Ricans now live in the States. If you were to take uh, stock in terms of the dominant language, I would think second and third generations prevail. And that we do have a, you know, settlements that are more recent, but now, by now, the dominant majority of the Puerto Rican population in the States is not the, the one that was concerned with looking back to the island with the group for Gorico and all that stuff. That has changed. I think there is a transnationalism, but it's with the hip hop and reggaeton and, and other cultural expressions that have nothing to do with the folkloric looking back to Puerto Rico. Yeah. And I think that conceptualization of uh, transnational, you know, is it transnationalism or is it a cultural uh, uh, identity uh, that, that goes beyond, uh, you know, the, the, the old concept of the state and, and so forth? But I think that's where, where I have difficulty. When, when I look at, you know, we have here some of the members of the Central uh, Demographic Change Group, you know, that it, led by Andres Torres, and Ms. Perez is there, and Professor Marsan is there, who else? Oh, Francisco Rebepo, Itervin, Benguayu is there, young cadres, right? These people are concerned about how it is that the demographic of our neighborhoods in New York, and, and, and it's a segmented reality. You know, you have the middle classes who are looking for suburbanization and so forth, and then you have, uh, you know, kind of a low wage segment of the population that have more circular migration. You know, going back to France, one is uh, you know, reserve army reality, and those are contraposed reality that coexist. And my problem with uh, the categories of, you know, colonialism and post-colonialism and even transnationalism is that they miss the boat as to it's kind of a, a departure from the island and the kind of a diaspora experience as opposed to a departure from uh, let's say Puerto Ricans in the U.S. and all all the different uh, patterns of uh, settlement, assimilation, incorporation, I and mean, it has a different debate. But the point is that that's the dominant reality for Puerto Ricans in the U.S. It's not the the newcomer. Uh, diaspora. I mean, there are settlements and they are growing, but I think if when you decompose the population, it's, it's, you know, the, the, out, the out migration from New York is more uh, dominant than the flow from Puerto Rico to Florida, uh, you know, uh, or kind of coming back and forth between, uh, you know, and, and Chicago and you know, suburbanization and so forth. So we're trying to dissect those patterns, but they have tremendous implications for how we conceptualize this, this whole question of uh, and, and so the colonial, post-colonial is a language from uh, Puerto Rico, the island, and the unresolved status and so forth. But how do we reconcile that with the uh, you know, hyphenated Puerto Rican-American uh, reality that you know, my children, the children of many people, or many of you, you know, your first language is English, it's not Spanish. You're never thinking about retiring in Puerto Rico like I do. You know, so how do you, how do you how do you bring those things together? And I think it's better to, to, to make a little bit more complex the categories and then, you know, 
Um, I don't know, but okay, you gotta help me here. With well done. The, the cultural transnationalism and stuff. Well, I, I, mean, I don't know. I, I, I don't have a good answer. I just posted a question. Is, it, is that a question? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm, I'm posted about the, 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 the concept of peace. Well, I want to go back to the, actually, you used the term transculturational transculturalism, which is a, <coughs> even earlier no, uh, expression of these kinds of concerns. And I just, just a footnote on that. Uh, when Fernando Ortiz coined the term transculturación, uh, and then uh, it was applied particularly to Cuba and to the mixture of African and, and Spanish cultural practice, it didn't really uh, feed the new literature of transnationalism. And to make matters more complex, according to your own comment, uh, trans transculturation may well be another way to approach uh, these issues rather than focusing on the nation in the transnationalism. Yeah. But anyway. Uh, and then an another uh, note on that is that uh, when uh, this literature emerged in the 1990s with uh, Nina Klingschitter and her colleagues, Puerto Rico was not part of the discussion. Uh, other Caribbean countries like the Dominican Republic, which have become sort of the, the model uh, for transnationalism everywhere, uh, and even the West Indies, uh, Haiti and so on, were uh, extensively uh, investigated from a transnational perspective, but Puerto Rico never really uh, was part of this discussion. And I guess, uh, I mean, maybe I, I can go back to your, to your comment later. Uh, you know, regardless of the terms that we use, and of course the terms are important, but I think what's important is that uh, we think about some of these issues and perhaps transnational is not an uh, appropriate term. Perhaps translocal, I would think now that's the term that he prefers, because then again, it sort of moves the discussion away from a nation-centered uh, view of, of things and identities and so forth. And perhaps it's place uh, and space uh, and class and race and other aspects. But let me, let me try to answer some of the questions that were raised. Um, do Puerto Ricans, uh, what, what do Puerto Ricans have in common with West Indians? I think in, in many ways they, they, they do come from a colonial background. I think I would insist on, on that aspect, on that issue. And uh, uh, even if they come to a different, they, you know, you can compare, for example, and other people have done that, uh, Nancy Cohn in particular, comparing the West Indian community in New York with the West Indian community and the former metropolis in London and the very interesting differences there uh, I I don't I'm not uh, an expert on that topic but I think again when you compare Puerto Ricans with other migrants uh, West Indians uh, and uh, and Latinos and uh, other national origins you find I think a similar um, uh, way in which they try to maintain those ties whether they be political or be economic cultural if the form in which those, tie, those ties are expressed is different so for example, I mentioned before that Puerto Ricans don't really send that much money back home as compared to uh, Dominicans who are really engaged in that practice. But on the other hand, uh, and that's also one of the reasons why I would still uh, use the term transnational, they uh, belong to, to clubs. Uh, they call home, they, they travel uh, frequently, they send um, um, all kinds of packages uh, you know, to their relatives. Uh, on the island, uh, they define themselves as Puerto Rican. I don't know about Puerto Rican American, I, perhaps the veterans, but uh, it's not a very strong and popular term in which, the, so the hyphen uh, doesn't really uh, apply, I think, uh, as well to, to Puerto Ricans as to other people. But, so uh, my comment would be, in general, to the, the question about the West Indies, is that this, this kind of uh, hybridity, and this kind <coughs> of mixture, and the attempt to somehow remain connected, like all diasporas do, I think the term diaspora uh, as well uh, is, is useful to, to try to uh, understand how people, even though they remain uh, away for a period of time, perhaps they'll never go back, they still think of themselves as part of that, that place of, 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 of origin. Uh, so the, some of the, 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 there were a couple of questions about migration policies and uh, whether it was necessary and how that uh, uh, was reconciled with nationals. I think Munoz Marin, uh, uh, as you know, he was, uh, He's a very complicated person with uh, you know, all kinds of uh, contradictions. And one of the main contradictions, I think, that comes out, um, and I was reading through his notes, uh, his handwritten notes uh, at the Luis Muñoz Marin Foundation in, in, in Trujillo Alto, uh, especially with regard to migration, is that he didn't really believe that migration should be uh, promoted. No. Because uh, you know, it wasn't really uh, his first option. He wanted uh, Puerto Ricans to stay in Puerto Rico and to be able to live uh, decently. On the other hand, as this, this, that short quote that I that I uh, showed you, he did. Uh, he was a pragmatic person, and he did, he did think that 
the only way to develop Puerto Rico, to pull it by its bootstraps, you know, as the, the language went, was to promote um, investment in Puerto Rico at the same time that population, and that was one question about population, was controlled. So this is part of a strategy, and one did not really work without the other. Uh, and of course, uh, he was very careful about, and his uh, government, uh, uh, the, the, the people that he named to the government also were very careful to, to not express publicly, at least, that Puerto Rico was encouraging migration. And as you saw in the uh, language of the law officially, the Puerto Rican government did not encourage or discourage migration. But it did uh, engage in a number of practices that made it easier for people to, to move. So there was a contradiction between the two, between the, on the one hand, the need to develop uh, a national identity within the uh, Commonwealth uh, status. Uh, language here, again, played a very important role. You know, during this, this period in the 1950s, at one point, Munoz Marin took a very strong stance uh, after Spanish, which should have been, uh, and then became the, the main language of instruction in Puerto Rico. Um, my own opinion that uh, Mario was, was asking me about is that uh, within the context and from the point of view of the planners and the policy makers, they did believe that it was necessary, that it was, that it was uh, the only way in which Puerto Rico could uh, develop sufficiently uh, at a rapid uh, stage uh, uh, by exporting part of that, that uh, labor. And I think, I think here I'm thinking of uh, Fran Bonilla's famous phrase that Manos, de, manos a la obra would have been named manos que sobra, right? because the idle hands that it created were uh, much more than the, the, employ, the employment that, uh, that it created uh, as part of industrialization. Um, so population is clearly connected to this, and uh, uh, of course migration is part of the equation uh, in which these uh, policymakers were working with in the 1950s, and clearly they were very influenced by uh, the, the, the Maltusian ideology in which you have to control population in order to uh, develop a country, especially in a, in, a, in, a, in a moment in which natural resources are not sufficient. So uh, what happened, in fact, during the 1950s is that the birth rate uh, um, decreased, as well as the, the, de the death rate. And so uh, the population growth in Puerto Rico was very low during the 1950s and 60s, in large part uh, because of migration. So had that, uh, had that uh, half a million people who left the island stay, some uh, economies uh, have estimated at least uh, the employment rate, unemployment would have been double uh, what it was in 1960, for example. So clearly, this was, this was part of migration was part of the strategy to, to control population in order to develop uh, uh, the country economically. Uh, why to the U.S.? As I mentioned before, some of the early uh, plans by people like Clarence Senior, for example, was very important in terms of drafting the first. Uh, he did mention the idea of colonizing. The, Use the term colony in that other sense of colonizing uh, places like Venezuela or, or Santo Domingo, places where uh, you know there was uh, some kind of uh, a job uh, demand uh, and uh, low population density, but it didn't work out in the end. In the end, most people, except for that early part of the 20th century, of course, which you have, where you have people going to Cuba, Santo Domingo, Saint Croix, uh, and uh, Hawaii, in particular. But after 1945. Overwhelm, overwhelming the, the, um, the Puerto Rican diaspora centers in the U.S. So why the U.S.? I think it's because it was a time in which uh, the early European migration had been cut off. Uh, uh, after the war, there was uh, uh, demand for, for cheap labor, uh, especially here in New York and other places. And so uh, Puerto Ricans responded to that labor demand. And in fact, some of the early recruitment efforts after the war, especially for manufacturing, for agriculture uh, in particular, um, um, had, had to do with the fact that there weren't enough uh, workers, uh, low-wage workers in this area, and Puerto Ricans basically came to fill that need. The situation in, in Florida, in, did, you, did you mention Jorge South or Central Florida? Because it really- yeah, I'm sorry, Florida. yeah, I meant Central and South. I agree yeah. with you that the, the race and class divisions are, are being reproduced, especially because that community, those, well, actually two communities, at least, not the South and the Central Florida community, uh, are so diverse, right? So uh, perhaps uh, uh, in, in contrast to the kind of migration that dominated the 1940s and 50s here, which was largely working class, here you have people from all, all, all walk, walks of life. Uh, I don't think it's a brain drain, but still, I'm from New York. and from New York, of course, so you have that other component and other places in, in the north. So um, 
So you have places like Kissimmee, and then you have places like Meadow Woods, which is sort of an upper middle class uh, place. And you know, they're all Puerto Rican, but they don't necessarily mix them. They don't go to the same places, the shopping places, where the kids don't go to the school. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. Uh, I think that's a, an emerging situation. We don't really understand it that well. But clearly, uh, it's a new um, phenomenon. It's something that doesn't really uh, have any you know, close historical precedents in other, in other places. Um, so that, that would be my, my general uh, take on that. Uh, and, 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 I, and, of, and I know, for example, that geographers who are you know, mapping these things are clearly showing that the Puerto Rican uh, community in, in Florida is, is extremely segregated within uh, you know, its own spaces. So that they're not as segregated for Afri from African Americans or from whites, but then you have internal uh, differences that are uh, quite dramatic, uh, as you probably know from your own experience. Um, I think we have a special issue with the Georgia that is coming out of, from Florida on the land of the Puerto Rican migration. Is a whole issue that to that about six papers. If I'm not mistaken, uh, anyone uh, knows whether we already went to press with that? It's coming no, it's out. Not, it's not. No, it's not. No, it's not. Press. Okay. No. Authors here, if you're open. I'm working on that. Oh. <laughs> okay, so we're in the process. Okay. So then the final, the final point that you made about translation. So I don't think translation is simply a question of folklore. I, I hope I didn't uh, project that image. It has to do with folklore. I still don't, uh, I mean, I would, as an anthropologist, I would uh, emphasize the importance of, you know, folk practice like the botanicas and the bodegas and the other things. But, uh, but one of the questions I think that, that comes from your um, intervention is whether transnationalism is a first generation only uh, experience. And I think it's, it's being debated within, uh, not only in Puerto Rican uh, literature, but also in the broader transnational literature. Uh, so far, most of the studies have focused on first generation migrants. And so that's why we, see we have a better picture of, of you know, what is it that, that uh, people who were born in one country and come to another do in order to keep in touch with their uh, homelands. What happens with the second and the, and the third and the fourth generation, then we don't really know that that much. But I know that the people are working on those issues. And what's interesting is that, for example, remittances are also sent by second generation immigrants, not just a, you know, not just a, the first uh, generation, but also, uh, even though it, de it, it decreases in the second generation, but it's still part of the uh, transnational um, uh, connection. Uh, tourism, let me, let me just, uh, since you're an economist and you like uh, those figures, I was looking at the figures for um, the Dominican Republic, for example, and something like eight or 10% of every year's arrival arrivals are from um, what they call, in, in the official figures, the, um, the Dominican diaspora, Dominicans abroad. Uh, I haven't seen uh, the data disaggregated by place of birth, but I'm sure it's not just the Dominicanos who left <coughs> the Dominican Republic, it's also the children who are going back sometimes to their parents. So, you know, depending on how, what measure you use, uh, it's traveling back, uh, calling back home, uh, sending money, uh, belonging to, to uh, clubs, uh, and these are data that are out there, uh, you do see uh, that uh, transnational is, is more enduring, that it's not just, uh, you know, 20, 30 years, and then when the first generation dies, it's all over. However, it changes, and we need to study better what changes after that happens.